Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on developments in nuclear energy. We have a fantastic panel that is prepared to discuss um, these issues, very important timely issues involving small modular reactors, policy issues, regulatory issues, technology issues. And we're gonna turn it over to the panel in just a minute. First of all, though, of course, I'd like to thank all of our partners who support for the educational informational programs that OEP provides, without whose support we just could not do this. So thank you very much to all of our many partners who support our work. For those of you um, joining us today, um, please know that we will be taking questions from you toward the end of the hour. So type them in, submit them, and uh, we will get to as many questions as we possibly can um, before we have to wrap up. Another thing I'd like to recommend to you is to check out the R Energy Library, which is on OEP's website. That library has many additional materials and resources on the issue we're discussing today. So if you want to continue to dive in even after the conversation, please go to our energy library and use any of the materials there. They're all free to use as part of our educational programs. So thank you again for joining us. And we're extremely privileged and fortunate today to be able to kick off the event with a video from Congressman Byron Donalds, Republican from the 19th District in Florida, and one of the members of Congress who has been a real leader in the area of nuclear energy. In fact, um, he has sponsored more than a dozen bills even this year as part of the 2023-24 Donald's nuclear energy package, all meant to elevate the role of nuclear energy in our nation's energy portfolio. So we're now going to turn it over to this video, which will kick off our event today. Congressman Donalds. Hi, I'm Congressman Byron Donalds, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to join your webinar today, but I really just want to share my support for the nuclear industry. Listen, nuclear power is the thing that can really help not just power America into the future, but it also will cut greenhouse emissions and give us the essential electricity we need on our electric grid. It could do more phenomenal things like water desalinization, help with more nuclear medicine for people who have some serious medical issues and a whole lot more. So I just wanted to share with you that I am fully in support of the nuclear industry. We have sponsored 20 bills here in Congress about nuclear power to expand it, not just our large reactors, but also those small modular reactors and those micro reactors and the fuel necessary to power it all. Count me as a full supporter of what you guys are doing, and I'm happy to be on your team. So our thanks to Congressman Donalds for that introduction. And we're now going to bring on our panel. We are very fortunate to have one of the nation's real experts on this topic, Christy Hartman, who is the Director of Stakeholder Relations Strategy and Engagement at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Previously spent eight years as the Director of Energy at the National Conference of State Legislators. So she really is one of the country's leading experts on this, and we're delighted to have her moderate the panel today. Christy? Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you to the whole team at our Energy Policy for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Certainly, you know, this is an exciting time for, for nuclear energy and really you know, nuclear is critical to achieving our energy security and, and climate goals in the U.S. And so, you know, I don't think that that is possible without the existing uh, nuclear reactors, as well as all the advanced reactor technologies that, uh, you know, we, we look forward to being deployed in the next few years. So I invite uh, my panelists to turn on their video. I want to do just very quick introductions of, of uh, the panel today, and then we're going to get into a series of, of questions. So um, first, I want to welcome Charlene Smith. Charlene is a senior nuclear energy analyst at the nuclear on the nuclear energy innovation team at the Breakthrough Institute. Um, she's originally from Jamaica. Charlene moved to the U.S. in 2012 to pursue a career in science and technology, focusing on energy solutions for current and future generations. Welcome, Charlene. Um, I also want to uh, introduce Gail Hoff. Gail has nearly 20 years of experience in the commercial nuclear industry, supporting all aspects from new construction to decommissioning. 
She is currently serving a one-year assignment as a senior technical advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy headquarters in D.C. Uh, previously, Gail was a senior R&D staff for innovative nuclear reactors at Oak Ridge National Lab. Welcome, Gail. And our uh, final panelist here is Brendan Kachunas. Brendan is an assistant professor in the Department of Nuclear Eng Engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, he holds degrees in nuclear engineering from Purdue, UC Berkeley, and the University of Michigan. His research specializes in the modeling and simulation design and operation of nuclear reactors. So uh, I welcome you all. Um, I do you know, want to just make another plug. If you have questions along the way, please, um, everyone, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and otherwise, I will get us started. Um, and I think you know, I wanted to start with kind of big picture. I know a lot of the discussion today will be around sort of advanced reactors and sort of where we're headed. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to start kind of big picture, just thinking about nuclear. Um, and I invite any of our panelists to answer, you know, what are some of the unique characteristics or, or opportunities um, that, that nuclear power provides, um, whether it's it, the existing fleet or, or new reactors, um, you know, that might be kind of unique in comparison to other energy resources such as uh, fossil fuels or, or renewables. I can start us off if you like. Great. Um, I, I think the, the biggest things are the carbon-free energy, of course, um, and that they are available 24 seven. Um, you know, where, where we're looking at other carbon-free energy sources, they don't have that 24-7 availability and reliability that we have in, in for our, our nuclear uh, fleet. Yeah, I'll echo that. I, I'd say um, the unique opportunity here for nuclear energy is rapid decarbonization. And nuclear energy, in my opinion, it combines the best of fossil fuel energy sources and renewable energy sources by providing base load energy that is clean um, that also has a relatively small land print as well. Yeah, and I think another another key aspect is it's dispatchable. So our other carbon free energy sources, primarily the renewables, aren't really dispatchable without additional technology. You need some energy storage to go along with it. And I think with with fossil, you know, you can say that those are carbon free if you add on the carbon uh, capture and, and sequestration, but again, it's you're taking something you have and you have to add an additional technology to have it do what nuclear already can. Well, great, thank you. And um, you know, maybe jumping into the advanced reactor space, you know, there's lots of different technologies and projects out there right now. I guess you know, and this might be more for Brendan or Gail. Uh, can you give the audience just kind of a quick snapshot of, you know, what types of advanced reactor technology, when we're saying advanced reactors or small modular reactors or micro reactors, what does that, what does that mean? And sort of what are, you know, maybe a, a, some examples of some of the projects that are sort of underway? Uh, yeah, I, I can start on this one. Um, I think right now in the present situation, we're, we're seeing uh, a lot more in terms of commercial companies interested in being reactor vendors. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this, I think, ever within the history of the nuclear industry. You still have your, I would say, like traditional legacy companies, your GE, your Westinghouse, um, your Riva or Framatome. And, uh, and now there's, you know, dozens of startups looking at the advanced reactor technologies. And so we've never seen a situation like that before. Um, it's all, you know, 50 years ago, it was, it was just a few companies, uh, again, you know, working through, I think, government support to, to bring this technology in, uh, to people and to commercialize it. Um, and in terms of like the technology of all the various reactors, uh, it, it's, you know, from our perspective, it's recycled ideas. We we pretty much know the full space of materials and things that can make up uh, a nuclear reactor. And there's a lot of history of pilot scale and experimental scale demonstrations that are now 40 plus years old. But for the new things that people want to build, we've built something similar to it before. Yeah, I can, I can add to that. Um, I mean, some of the, the main concepts are 
being looked at, like Brendan mentioned, are things we have done in the past or that have been done other places, high temperature gas reactors, molten salt reactors, um, and uh, and liquid metal uh, fast reactors are, are some of kind of the main things when we talk about advanced reactors, but we're also talking about advanced uh, light water reactors too that are um, smaller or in a different integrated safety features than, than what we have in our existing fleet. Um, I also wanted to mention in, in policy space, uh, the Department of Energy, we have um, you know, several, several programs going on to, to help support the development of these programs, looking at the advanced reactor demonstrations, which are stuff that we're expecting to see built in the short term, the risk reduction for future demonstrations, which is sort of shepherding that, that next set that's not quite ready to be built now, but will be built soon, hopefully. And then um, looking at advanced reactor concepts, um, which again is sort of shepherding the, the next, next iteration of uh, advanced reactors that we're hoping to see demonstrated here in the US. Yeah, I'd just like to add though that there, I mean, these advanced developers, they are at least in pre-licensing um, activities um, with, with the NRC. And so far what we can see from these developers is that, um, you know, Kairos is an interesting one uh, because they have taken on a iterative development plan. Um, as far as pre-licensing versus licensing activities, the research reactors are ahead of the, the curve. So we're talking about Kairos, Kairos's Hermes reactor um, and Abilene Christian University, um, it's a research non-power molten salt uh, reactor that are um, you know, progressing a lot faster than the uh, power reactors that are still in uh, pre-licensing and, and I think at least Kairos's approach to say, okay, well, we're going to demonstrate our technology via research reactor in iterative steps before launching or submitting an application for their power reactor to set a precedent for their design so that by the time they do submit their power reactor design, there's already that familiarity um, in, in licensing and regulation with, with the NRC for them to step on the power side of things. Great, thank you all. And, um, you know, just, Kind of diving into this a little bit more, I guess what differentiates advanced reactor technologies from sort of the larger um, existing fleet? So whether it's size, Gail, you mentioned sort of some passive safety, you know, use fuel. I'd welcome any comments sort of what, what makes these advanced reactor technologies, and there certainly are a lot of different um, technologies out there, what makes them different from the larger nuclear fleet? I think uh, the most obvious one, at least there, is, is flexibility and accessibility. So having the advanced reactors um, being deployed in off-grid, uh, off the grid, on the grid, in remote areas, in developing countries, small island nations, the accessibility is, is of, of nuclear energy or clean baseload energy is, is broadened. And I think that's one of the main or one of the most, the more obvious um, differentiators of, of, of the advanced reactors versus the traditional reactors. That's and the, the, the notion that, you know, it's, you know, you're doing less, con you have less constru construction costs because your advanced reactors are being, are factory built, they're shipped to a desired uh, location and then assembled on site. Um, and additionally, the, the fact that they have enhanced um, passive safety systems, which allows the reactors to operate normally without um, having to need external power and that mitigates or minimizes the risk of, of uh, fuel meltdown or core meltdown. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll add that, right, I think there's kind of three ways you can sort of differentiate what's advanced nuclear and, and certainly one of those is the passive safety systems. Um, you know, the, the, the one major uh, nuclear accident in, in the U.S. historically kind of came from the fact that you had a system that was so complex, it was really challenging for your operators to understand what was going on. Uh, and they, you know, because they thought something else was going on, they they didn't make the, the best choice of action. Um, now, kind of all of that sort of passive, it's based on physics, you know, things like gravity and natural circulation, it requires no human intervention. So that's one thing. And we see that technology uh, rolling out already. So the AP-1000s that just came online in Georgia and, you know, a few years ago in China, 
have that technology. It's It's been heavily studied at this point. Um, the other major differentiator, I think, is um, power output. So, you know, our commercial industry is large baseload plants. It's based on economies of scale. You get something really big and that's how you maximize your profits. And now um, I think a lot of the new thinking is around economies of multiples. So a big reactor requires a big capital investment. And, you know, you, I don't think in, in a diverse kind of energy infrastructure, you, you can rely on a one size fits all solution, right? If you think about it in terms of transportation, you don't want like everyone driving the same coach tour bus, right? A really big transportation vehicle. And, you know, you have people on bikes, you know, sedans, trucks, you know, buses, all kinds of things. So um, that's uh, another area where a lot of the advanced nuclear is looking. So that's kind of what small modular reactor and micro reactors are, are fitting into. And part of the reasoning for that is, um, you know, there's less risk on your upfront capital cost. Large capital intensive projects are always, you know, not just nuclear, but anywhere are, are challenging. Um, and so, you know, you can significantly de-risk um, your capital investments you know, even with the uncertainty, it becomes more manageable, manageable rather than having a $10 billion reactor with plus or minus 5 billion on that. You're talking about something that's 100 million uh, plus or minus 100 million. It's a lot easier to get financing for, for something like that. And yeah. uh, the third differentiator is, is the actual technology itself. So all of our commercial plants now are light water reactor. A lot of the newer ones are, are things that um, I think Gail mentioned you're you know, liquid metal fast reactors. Again, we've had these built to pilot scale before. High temperature gas reactors have been built to scale before. You know, there was one that operated commercially for a number of years in Colorado. So it's not, again, it's not new technology, but it's it's just coming back. I just wanted to build on something that, that Brendan mentioned that part of part of what's happening with advanced reactors right now is that it's not just the reactors that are advancing but the business models associated with those right so we're looking at new business models new markets we're looking at um, coupling with industrial facilities steel chemical manufacturing where they need that always on, always available, clean energy. They're very interested in small modular reactors. Um, that's the right size for them um, and the right the right level of, of safety boundaries. Um, we're, we're looking at coal to nuclear transition where we can swap in, use some of that in, in existing infrastructure to replace um, decommissioning coal plants with um, with small modular reactors. And also there's a lot of really exciting new business model opportunities with micro reactors where we can be powering remote communities in the Arctic or Antarctic. Um, you could have backup power, deployable power systems um, that the, the Department of Defense is looking at right now with Project Pele. So it's it's not just the technology that that we're we're advancing, it's also the business models associated with those. And and I think that's one of the most exciting things right now they're being very smart about it too in terms of you know they're, they're looking for where people pay a premium for heat and electricity right is it high reliability is it uh remote locations where if it's uh something you have to continuously fuel and maintaining a fuel supply chain out there that can be really expensive so definitely um yeah that was one thing i want to mention i'm glad you brought that up gail and I also, I do want to come back to sort of the cost of advanced reactors. Um, that is something that I work on a lot on behalf of the Nuclear Energy Institute. But, you know, maybe first, you know, we think about there's so many benefits and there's clearly a need to advance reactor technologies, both in the U.S. and abroad. But, you know, these are, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of the NRC licensing process. There are a number of, you know, maybe remaining hurdles to get uh, deployment of new reactors. So um, for all of you, you know, what are those kind of biggest challenges that lie ahead uh, for new reactor deployment? I'll jump in on this one. Um, so 
so Brennan had mentioned the with the smaller reactors, you know, you're sort of um, lowering that upfront cost before you start getting electricity on the grid. But there's a there's a really great report and analysis that Department of Energy put out. Um, they're called the liftoff reports, and there's one on advanced nuclear, and it looks at like the the Vogel reactors and um, in Georgia, and it looks at all those those specific things and how do we get to that nth of a kind um, to, to drive those costs down. When when you're building a first of a kind, there's no supply chain established. There's no people, that, workers that have done this work before. So every, everyone is being trained up. The suppliers are being trained up and built up and developed because the last time we did this was you know, 40, 40, 50 years ago. So we need to maintain and continue to build that that workforce, the um, that supply chain. We need to keep those folks engaged and working in these areas and continue to build out. And that's that's how we're going to drive down to that that nth of a kind cost. Yeah, I, I will say that that um, as a nuclear, you know, we. I think us, the panelists, are are hopeful that you know we see a resurgence in, in deployment and new nuclear plants being built. Um, but the, I think there will be a very heavy upfront cost, which is investing in the supply chain. Uh, I think internationally, you might have one or two countries with a supply chain to build reactors, and that would be China and South Korea. They have everything, you know, soup to nuts. And in the US, we kind of just let that wither because we went 40, 50 years without building reactors. Uh, and, you know, the, the quality of construction at a nuclear plant is like, if you haven't been in one, it's really something. It's not just regular concrete, like on your sidewalk, it's high quality concrete. It's not just regular uh, wiring and cabling and, and welding. It's, it's a really lot of specialized construction techniques that does take a lot of skill and qualification. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's part of the reason why it is so reliable is because it's built to such a high standard. Yeah. I'd also add that one of the, the more upfront inhibitors to, um, SMR advancement now is, is it is a fuel? It is a, it is a supply chain. More specifically, at least at the top of the list, it is a fuel supply chain because we've seen that the instability of that fuel supply chain is you know it's impacting licensing um, and regulation of the um, advanced reactor designs. Terra Power announced a two year delay simply because of. Um, the the issues with with the fuel supply chain. I think that's in addition to, to everything else that um, Gail and Brennan mentioned, we need to be building up our workforce. I mean, we do have, um, uh, say that close to a critical mass, not even, I don't think of, of nuclear engineers that are ready to, um, you know, you know, run these reactors, you know, build them um, and operate them uh, to the scale that we're expecting to build out these advanced reactors. And so I think, one um, really important area that needs to be really bumped up is trying to, you know, get more talent in the industry um, because it's 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 becoming, you know, quite a concern. The NRC, for example, a third of the NRC's workforce is retiring, and, and that's one example of of needing to, you know, you know, work on that infrastructure that that the human capital that that will be needed to to whether it's license. Um, design, operate, you know, maintain uh, these reactors. That's something that is is definitely going to come up. And all of this, you know, it's going to lead back to as well um, how to how fast we can license uh, and deploy these these reactors. So all of these issues are, are are interconnected. But I think for for now, I think the fuel supply chain is is really where the mess is right now um, because then that is directly causing the licensing delays. Yeah, um, just to add to that, the, and, and these types of issues that, that we've just raised are, are we're, we're sort of, well, the industry, industry, universities, federal agencies are already aware of these and already responding to them. DOE pro is developing programs and has programs for workforce development. And, you know, in conversations with people I've had at Westinghouse, you know, they, they see the this 
stall in the fuel supply chain as a real business opportunity where they can step in and take that. So. Yeah, thank you all. And I think, you know, there's so many good directions we can go in the conversation from here. I mean, I do think, you know, we're talking specifically fuel supply chain, but certainly I think the supply chain, you know, across the energy sector, it's not just nuclear that's facing sort of some of these these challenges. I mean, I think you've brought up good points. Uh, NEI has been very vocal about NRC regulatory reform that, you know, just to sort of meet the demand of advanced reactors, um, sort of we need we need sort of new new planning in place from the NRC. And then that third piece on the workforce is, is so critical. Uh, you know, maybe for Brendan from the university perspective, you know, what's, you know, sort of what's in place, what's happening kind of from the university side or maybe the University of Michigan sort of to build that next um, generation nuclear workforce? Yeah. Um, so on, on the university side, you know, the, the way that we kind of look at that is, um, is just, you know, our annual enrollment. And is it going up? Is it going down? And is it staying flat? What can we do about that? Um, and, you know, it's not on a, it's not on an exponential increase, you know, where, where that's happening is you see a lot of kids these days want to go into, um, you know, uh, computer science or computer engineering. Uh, and so I think uh, for us as an academic institution, we sort of have to promote ourselves a lot more and, and make ourselves more attractive to the students. I, um, yeah, I think that that's kind of the main thing. We have to lure students from other disciplines to take an interest. And, and I'll also add that, you know, it's a, as an industry um, for power generation, you, it's very multidisciplinary. You need a lot of people who are not nuclear engineers involved as well. So I think as, you know, for employers um, offering, uh, you know, I think this is generally true, but people who work at nuclear power plants um, have competitive pay and um, good job stability. Thanks. And, you know, I think from most of the work that I do uh, is focused on state outreach, but I certainly think, you know, there's a number of states that are sort of building various working groups focused on sort of the workforce and education piece. There's, you know, universities all over the country that are really trying to build out, whether it's nuclear engineering or, um, you know, I, I'm certainly glad to be involved sort of in the nuclear indus industry and I come with a policy background. So we're not all sort of more technical, but, you know, I think it's all really important to the, the next generation workforce. Um, you know, maybe I want to go back to Plant Vogel. Certainly it is so exciting to see Unit 3 come online and, um, you know, Unit 4 is closely behind. And I think we're already seeing some of those lessons learned from Unit three being applied to the um, schedule for, for unit four and, and lots of positive news. I guess, you know, even though we're primarily talking about smaller reactors, so not kind of the larger AP 1000, but what can we take, you know, from first new reactors kind of built in the US, what can we, what lessons learned can we take from the experience with Plant Vogel and maybe apply to, to new reactors? And I kind of welcome a response from any of the panelists. Uh, so I can start. I, I think, um, again, the, the biggest kind of concern, my, my impression is it's it's on the financing and, and certainty around being able to get something licensed and built. And, uh, you know, a decade or so ago, maybe more, um, NRC uh, laws were passed and, and NRC is working on kind of new ways to make it easier to get reactors licensed and built. Um, but I think getting the uncertainty around financing down is, you know, if you look at somebody, a uh, financial firm, and they can invest in, you know, product A or product B, and B is a lot more uncertainty, and they're equally expensive, like you're going to go with the one with less uncertainty. It's as simple as that. So um, I, I think for, for Vogel, as I would encourage the, the people who are doing the analysis of, of, you know, potential improvements there making that information broadly known. Um, now it's a, it's a distinct competitive advantage in the business sense, but uh, I think it will do more good um, ultimately if it's, if it's sort of shared broadly. Because then, you know, you have more people looking at that problem and more people thinking about how to, how to solve it. Yeah, and I could just add, I, I 
I touched on this briefly before, but um, you know, part of part of what happened at Vogel is just we haven't done this in a really long time, right? So our our licensing folks are are out of practice, or they haven't. There's just their first time doing this sort of work. Or the the supply chain again, you know, that's needed to be stood up. So the best thing that we can do to make sure that future projects are successful is continue to do new projects. Uh, you know, and obviously the Department of Energy is is doing what we can with that, with um, keeping the demonstration projects going, keeping new, um, you know, new, new things in the pipeline. So as we continue to develop, there's always new, new projects and new building, new development on the horizon. Great. Yeah. yeah. And oops, sorry, Charlene, go ahead. Just to just to add a small nugget, nugget on top of everything that um, was said. Yeah, I, I, I agree, um, Gail, that, you know, having core teams, you know, transfer knowledge um, in a way that it keeps the, the machine running is, is something that's going to be important, especially coming from the NRC. And not only that, but having the licensing and regulatory framework be modernized in such a way that we're kind of eliminating a lot of unnecessary redundancies in a lot of the regulatory processes that already exist for um, your or, or traditional reactors and then taking those lessons learned and then moving on to um, the, the draft 10 CFR part 53 rulemaking to apply um, a modernized approach that would meet um, the demand of those advanced reactors that are not necessarily that don't have the same risk and, and reward profiles as our existing reactors as well. Yeah, and I do, you know, I want to go back. I said I wanted to go back to the sort of cost of advanced reactors. And Gail, you know, thanks for you know making a plug for the pathways to commercialization report. I think that that coming from the DOE loan program was, you know, has been really great to see and it's something certainly that NEI is is using and, and promoting because uh you know we we do get so many questions on sort of what is this going to cost um and and um you know certainly I have opinions on this a lot of what what I do you know focus with the state regulators I'm talking about costs and sort of looking at what is the value of nuclear we sort of have these um older systems of how we value energy resources and and you know from my perspective i talk a lot more about it's not specifically project costs but sort of the full system cost of nuclear when you start looking at that nuclear becomes much more competitive against other energy resources when it you know project costs are higher um but uh you know when you're looking at the life of of a nuclear plant 60 80 who knows how many years um you know that really changes the equation a lot um, so maybe just thinking about costs, you know, we've we've surveyed our utility members and they've basically come back to us and said, you know, we need 330 new advanced reactors in the next 25 years. I mean, that's huge. That's a that's a big number. And, you know, we've seen other kind of estimates. Certainly DOE has, you know, the loans program has has made uh, large estimates as well. You know, for you all in your perspective, you know, is nuclear cost effective? You know, what do we need to do to get from that kind of first of a kind cost to the nth of a kind cost? How do we kind of bring costs down? Um, you know, those are the types of questions that I hear all the time. So I, I would love sort of any reaction and response to that on the cost side from you all. I just want to give a, a small uh, antidote of uh I was at a, a conference and there were a number of universities that were talking about building research reactors and small modular reactors at the universities. And um, there was someone in the audience that kept asking, well, what's the dollars per megawatt? What's the dollars per megawatt? And finally I had to get up and say, and say something. And I said, when you're building a research reactor, a first of a kind at a university, who cares about the dollars per megawatt, right? That what you're getting out of that is not megawatts, it's learning, it's understanding, it's training our, our future industry leaders. Like those are the things that we really need to be focusing on with these with these first of a kind uh, reactors. Like the, the learning that we're getting out of that is invaluable. The dollars per megawatt, 
like I said, who cares about that? You know, we, we do need to focus on that end of a kind. We do need to focus on getting there as fast as possible. But the way that we do that is through you know, learning as much as possible in these, these first and then sharing that information broadly. Yeah, the, the whole idea of, of a lot of these companies, you know, coming to universities to, to build a reactor, that that's a, I think that's a very smart kind of thing to do on behalf of the companies because it's a different licensing pathway is because you're not producing power for commercial consumption. And so it's a lot easier. So you're able to get something built and learn a lot from it at a much lower cost before, you know, trying to build the huge thing for the first time where you have a lot less knowledge about maybe how it operates. So it's, it's a good intermediate step and stepping stone. Um, and that explains exactly why Kairos and Abilene Christian University are, you know, uh, are above the curve um, with NRC on, on, in, in, in that front. Um, I think though too, you know, when, when we move from first of a kind to end of a, end of a kind, there is this notion in the, in the nuclear industry that you know, no one wants to be the first to go through a particular licensing process. Everybody wants to be second and third. And that's because of the, the landscape, the regulatory landscape and the lack of certainty around that with being the first that you know makes it seem very expensive because you can go through a licensing process to, to try to get your design license and it takes years and years and years. And you have you, you have people who are like, okay, well, maybe this is not going to get licensed, or maybe it's not going to get licensed in time. Maybe I should, you know, put my investments elsewhere. But the, the, th the thing is that once the license is approved, that releases, that opens up the gate for um, really everyone to feel some level of regulatory certainty to say that, okay, well, this is something that is licensable um, and that we can, you know, you know, effectively deploy beyond that. And even also on the other side, when we're talking about the economics of, of, of nuclear uh, energy long term, there is a recent study that was uh, published by the, uh, the um, Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear um, that looked at the economics of repurposing the Coronado new, uh, generating station. Um, and it looked at the, the socioeconomic characteristics of having that station run by coal versus nuclear. Um, and that study essentially showed that if it's run by nuclear instead of coal, because I mean, and, and they did that study because there is an announced retirement of 20, 2032. If you run it um, with, with nuclear instead of coal, you have increased number of jobs, you have um, increased labor income, you have increased local GDP. There are so many advantages that come with, come with that. And that report kind of outlines extensively what the economic impacts are of transitioning that particular um, coal side to, to, with nuclear. And I, that's to say, again, it's just not one size fit, fits all because um, all coal plant sites in the US won't make sense um, technically and economically for a nuclear transition, but it's all about trying to figure out where the best opportunity is um, when we look at that coal um, to nuclear landscape. Just to add a, a little bit to what Charlene mentioned about the the hesitancy for being the the first in line for licensing a new design, we are starting to see some interest in in consortiums of people that want to build the same type of reactor. I'm sure you guys have seen this as well. Um, that they're they're sort of banding together and be like, okay, so whoever's going first, uh, you know, we're we're going to kind of share that cost so that so that we can all get this get this through a little bit faster and a little bit cheaper. I think that's again another another place where we're seeing people really being creative with some of these business models. Yeah, uh, th th there's really no incentive to be the first, right? You're going to pay this upfront cost, and everyone else is going to benefit from it. And so, you know, I think what the the example that Gail just gave is like, well, okay, so the, the person who's kind of motivated to to get the ball rolling is contacting other people and say like, hey, you know, share the cost, and we'll share. The reward that makes sense yeah well, and i do think you know there are you know federal policies we've seen recent congressional action you know that may help support advanced reactors or you know maintaining the existing fleet of nuclear um you know i i 
kind of welcome any thoughts from the group or just sort of a lay of the land of, you know, what are sort of DOE programs? Gail, you mentioned ARDP, but maybe providing a little bit more information on what that is um, for the audience. Uh, but sort of what is in place that may, you know, support advanced reactors um, and, you know, might not totally address sort of first of a kind cost, but certainly kind of give that policy signal that there's support for advanced reactors in the U.S. Sure. So, um, as I mentioned before, the, the advanced reactor demonstration program, ARDP, um, has has several different facets to it. So so the first phase is the the funding for demonstration projects, um, and that's looking to to test, license, and build uh, a reactor that's going to be operating within the next five to seven years. So that's stuff that is starting now, um, starting to get shovels in the ground, and things are are starting to be purchased and procured uh, for those projects. Um, and uh, and the the ones there that that have received funding are the the natrium reactor and the XE100 um, from TerraPower and X Energy respectively. Um, next is the risk risk reduction program um, where we're looking to kind of keep solving those technical and operational and regulatory challenges um, for new reactors that will be built within the next 10 to 14 years. Um, the ones there are, um, are from Kairos Power, the, the Westinghouse Evinci, BWXT, um, Advanced Nuclear Reactor, the Holtec SMR-160, and um, the Molten Chloride Fast Reactor from Southern Company. And then finally, the, the third phase, the risk reduction, is, is looking at the further development of advanced concepts um, that will be potentially ready for development and demonstration in the mid-2030s. Um, so that's kind of what we have in the ARDC. P space. There's lots of other, there's, there's so much funding. It's almost hard to, to keep track of everything. Uh, Charlene mentioned the gateway for um, advanced innovation and nuclear gain, um, where, where companies can apply to do a study or basically hire the national laboratories for free to do some work for them. Um, for example, uh, there's been some industrial companies that we're looking at if they um, put in a, an SMR doing a feasibility study that's been funded through GAIN. So there's, there's lots of different opportunities. I'm sure there's, there's many others that, um, that can be mentioned as well. Great, and maybe um, this, I, you know, I haven't uh, asked uh, our panelists this previously in, in any of our prep, but I do think about, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we're primarily talking about electric applications for, for new reactors, but, what about sort of non-electric applications? Where might there be opportunities for new nuclear that you know we haven't talked about so far in this conversation? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here. Um, a big one is Dow Chemical, right? They're they're a global multi-billion-dollar industry, and anytime they decide to do something, it's hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, and they have decided that uh, if they're going to have a future um, producing chemicals, they need a carbon-free dispatchable, reliable energy source. And so they've partnered with X Energy and they've got plans to deploy several of those at a one of their uh, chemical plants in, in Texas. And what I've heard is that since, um, since Dow made that move, a lot of other chemical manufacturers are now doing the same thing. They didn't really consider it at, or were aware of it as an option and they see it as a really good idea. Um, and then the other thing to point out that, that's sort of emerging, um, and there was some news on this just yesterday, where Microsoft is hiring someone to be like in charge of small modular reactor deployment for their data centers. But big tech, tech companies run big data centers, and you know those are megawatts of electricity. And uh, they have really high standards of reliability, like they're only down for six minutes a year. Um, and so they have lots and lots of redundant power systems um, and, and they are willing to pay a, a nice premium for reliability in their power source. Um, and, you know, basically at this point, uh, they don't want to be, I, I think the feeling is they're, they're a little hesitant to be um, relying on just 
connections to the grid because at least here in Southeast Michigan, we've had a lot of interruption from major storms and things. And I don't know if that's going to get any better anytime soon. So, you know, they're not going to rely on the transmission system. They're just going to have their power local. Yeah. And another thing that we haven't mentioned is, is clean hydrogen, which is very exciting. Um, uh, Constellation Energy has just started um, a, a demonstration, nuclear powered clean hydrogen facility um, at one of their, their plants in Oswego, New York. And um, nuclear is such a great opportunity to, to use energy to, to convert energy into other products, energy products that are basically ways of storing energy. So hydrogen is one way of storing, you can generate ammonia, um, which is another way of, of storing energy. And um, we can look at, at nuclear in combination with, with re renewable um, wind and solar energy and and when wind and solar are on the grid and maybe the nuclear is not needed at that time, it can swap over to generating hydrogen and, and basically storing energy for other applications. And then at night or you know, when, when the wind stops blowing, the nuclear energy starts going back on the, on the electric grid. So there's a lot of really great opportunities where we can have these sort of flexible non-electric um, or electric generation capabilities through, through nuclear energy um, that I think is just really gonna, gonna change the industry. Well, thanks. And I know we have a number of questions um, that have come in from the audience. And I actually, I just have one last question for the group before turning it over to Jordan and the team at our energy policy. But, you know, I get questions all the time about, uh, you know, what about the nuclear waste? What about use fuel? And so, you know, kind of quickly so that we can answer some um, of the audience questions, just sort of how is use fuel currently stored um, for existing nuclear and maybe what's the difference in, in kind of nuclear waste use fuel for um, advanced reactors? Um, I, I, so I want to make a kind of one, one or two comments here. Um, the, the first is if, if you just consider uh, waste in terms of mass, nuclear power is orders of magnitude, hundreds or thousands of times more energy dense. So you get hundreds or thousands of times more bang for your buck in terms of just the amount of material that you need to create your electricity. So, you know, uh, fossil fuels will produce, you know, hundreds of tons of, uh, you know, carbon and nuclear, you know, would produce a tenth of a ton, right, uh, of used fuel for the same amount of energy. So it's a lot less mass that you're dealing with. Uh, and you also know where it is. You know, we, we um, and, and I think longer term, um, it, it may become a profitable asset. But um, that would require, I think, some changes in the economic landscape. We know how to reuse it in some contexts, but maybe we find cheaper ways to do it. Yeah, and when we know, you know, nuclear waste uh, or spent fuel, you know, it's it's high level waste that remains dangerous for thousands of years. Um, but we do, at, by the same time, we do have these advanced. Um, reactor technologies that have the potential to significantly reduce the volume and longevity of uh, nuclear waste. And so that goes back to, you know, reprocessing, you know, these different reactor designs that um, are able to reuse spent fuel or nuclear waste um, in their reactors. And then on the other side, we do know that um, geological repositories are an effective, safe, long-term solution. And that's because nature showed us that it is, uh, because the, 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 the only known um, natural nuclear reactor existed more than 2 billion years ago. And the accumulated, the waste, nuclear waste generator, spent fuel generated from that natural nuclear reactor didn't move more than 10 feet from where it was generated. So we know that, I mean, if, if, if we bury it, if, if we bury the waste um, in a way that is more advanced and even safer than what we've seen for the Oklo reactor from 2 billion years ago, we 
we we are we also have solutions for it. So there is a sense of you know taking that spent fuel, which is an energy dense resource that we can then reuse to reduce the volume and also to re reduce the radioactivity. But at the same time, you know use re let's recycle it or reprocess it as much as we can until we can't reprocess it anymore. And when we can't reprocess it anymore, we put it in a uh, deep geological repository, which we know we know works. And I'll, Go ahead, yeah. I'll, I'll just add, um, as somebody that, that formerly worked at operating plants, right now that I spent a lot of time with both new and spent fuel um, in the in the reactor buildings, and it's it's safe to be around. It's safely stored in either in water pools or in dry casks. Um, we know we know how to handle it. Like uh, Brendan said, we know where it is. We know how much of it we have. Um, we know exactly where it's going, which is nowhere right now. Um, but there is a, a lot of efforts um, with the the Department of Energy as well, working on consent based siting. There are communities that want to host this resource, this energy resource of um, of the used fuel from our nation's reactors. So that's that's currently progressing, um, and and hopefully we'll we'll continue to see movement in that area. But there, it's it's not. It's not a not wanted here. There are definitely communities that are interested in being host, in in part for the, some of the reasons that Charlene mentioned about, um, you know, it is a resource that can be used again, and and communities that are hosting these interim storage facilities will be poised for whatever that next use uh, may be when that comes. Yeah, and yeah. just to add on to, to 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 Gail, I mean, the nuclear industry, and we don't talk about it enough, is that the nuclear industry, the nuclear energy industry, is the only industry that is responsible or, or knows exactly where our nuclear waste is or, or you know you know, has full responsibility over every gram of waste that is produced other um energy industries they, they can't make the same claim um, and i think that's really important because it demonstrates how serious our industry is about safety and how uh, invested we are in making sure that you know, we are operating with, with transparency and that we have, or that we are looking towards solutions to, you know, um, adequately, whether it's dispose or dispose of or reuse um, this uh, the, the, the nuclear waste. And we know that also reprocessing is not something that is, is novel either, because France has been doing it at La Hague for, for over 30 years as well. Um, and the US, does reprocess, but not uh, commercially. Uh, yeah. Let's just say that they, they, we have a history of reprocessing. So it's not something that is novel, something that we just figured out that we could do. The technology is there. We just need to have policies that enable us to, um, you know, use access or, 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 you know, have access to the resource. Yeah, there, there's one more quick point I want to make to just sort of simplify the whole discussion, which is I think that the nuclear waste argument is is kind of a, a straw boogeyman. You know, you're worried about something that's going to happen in the future 10,000 years from now, where I think there, there's sort of a majority that believes, you know, if we continue on this current path, we'll be dead in 200 years from climate change. So there, you have to consider the long-term trade-offs. And, you know, I don't think you can point to anything in human history where we have sort of responsibly shepherded it for more than a thousand years. Uh, I think the closest you can come in that argument are various religions. So to, to ask, to require a company today to say, we are gonna be safe for longer than our, you know, the world's popular religions seems just completely ridiculous to me. Yeah. Sorry, if I can quickly jump in here, we're running short on time. I appreciate you bringing up that last question you addressed about 20 of the questions in the chat, broadly speaking. Um, but I'll, I'll jump in with this first question here. And I think this is from an investor perspective, just trying to understand the, the permitting process for getting these uh, reactors up and running. Uh, kind of could someone give kind of a thirty thousand uh, foot view of just that process uh, from start to finish? 
I mean, there's there's several different pathways, and um, we've we've alluded to that. I think both Charlene and, and Brandon has, have mentioned different pathways. There's there's the commercial licensing pathway through the the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There's um, there's a government licensing pathway through the Department of Energy, and then there's a, a research reactor. Um, pathway that's it again through the the NRC so each of I don't I don't think if we had a whole nother hour we could get into the from start to finish of any of those but um, but just to understand that there are several different ways depending on on who's building the reactor what the usage is um, what the intended purposes are there's there's different pathways that have different kind of pros and cons uh, yeah, I'll try and sort of give a, a simplified concrete example for just just one of those. But basically, um, it used to be it was separate processes. This was probably 60 years ago um, for getting a construction license and then an operating license. So you can build the whole thing and never get your operating license. They fixed that about 20 years ago. So you can you you apply for a combined construction operating license. So once you have that, you are you're approved to build it and run it. Um, Prior to that, you know, reactor vendors will get a design certification or they basically tell the NRC, this is the design of our reactor. Here's the scientific evidence that it's safe and they'll review that. And when they agree that it's safe, that's a certified design that's like approved for purchase. Um, and then the, the other sort of sticky point is, is the siting. So like, where are you going to put it? Um, you typically have to do environmental studies, seismic studies that are site specific for that. And um, with, uh, with the smaller reactors, that's much less of a concern and much less of a cost because the amount of radioactive material there is so much less. Your sites become much, much smaller and it becomes much, much cheaper. Um, but that's the basic, basic parts of it. If you're an investor and you want to build it, then you need to find somebody who wants to build and operate it. You go through the combined operating licensing, uh, pathway, um, and that will involve, uh, you know, uh, approval at uh, for a specific site, um, and then in the construction process, you know your construction gets qualified through um, uh, uh, codes in the um, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, so that they control like the building code. So you say I'm going to build it, and then they'll you know they'll do tests to say you built it correctly. Very well. I appreciate that feedback. Um, I, I know there's certainly a lot of questions surrounding permitting, so uh, I appreciate that quick quick response there. Uh, next question is, is land around abandoned coal mines unstable or stable to safely house a nuclear plant? And what goes into that analysis? I, I would say probably um, they, they'll have different require like the, the siting of a coal plant will should have different requirements than a nuclear plant. I would expect that on the environmental side. And so here they look at like how much heat are you putting into the river next to you? And is that going to make the river too hot and things like that? Um, those are probably going to be pretty similar. I think the one that might be different is the seismic aspect. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of things you can do in the construction, like based on the seismology of the area that, that would let you do that. But if you're in a more seismically active region, then you might have higher construction costs and you might need to do an analysis to show that if you make these modifications, then it's safe to operate. But and, otherwise, and I, go ahead. And I just wanted to, to jump in and, um, and clarify, I mentioned the coal to nuclear and it's not coal, coal mined to nuclear reactor. It's coal, it's a thermal plant to nuclear reactor. So it's yeah. not on the site of a coal mine. Generally, the thermal plants are not built directly next to coal mines, although um, sometimes they're nearby. Uh, but it, it's looking at reusing the infrastructure, the electrical uh, grid and equipment, um, reusing the, the staff and personnel resources. Um, a lot of the balance of plant is um, is the same between a nuclear. It's just a nuclear plant is just a heat source. It's heating some water. It's running some, some turbine, turning some turbines, running some generators. Um, so, so reusing 
staff or retraining um, staff that needs to be retrained for operational roles and stuff like that. So that's that's the goal. And I, I, I think the study, I, I'm forgetting the exact numbers, maybe Charlene, you remember, I think it's like you can reuse about 60 percent of the, the infrastructure somewhere, somewhere around that 50 to 70 percent of the, the coal plant, thermal plant infrastructure for an SMR. Yeah, it depends on the coal plant, though. It it it, it vary. It does vary. But I think what um, would be good for us to to leverage in that case when we're talking about the the transition from coal to nuclear is the early site permits, because um, the early site permit is something that you can go for um, that you know you don't have to have a specific reactor design. Instead, it looks at an envelope. Um, of designs, and when you were talking about existing coal plants, it's considered a brownfield site. And so, um, when you are doing site characterization, you are uh, potentially looking at you know areas that are were previously disturbed. Um, so it's it's you know looking at uh, it's it's the other side permit provides you a way to try to evaluate that site um, for for simplicity to see um, it, to understand its eligibility for uh, transition to nuclear. And so on the regulatory side or the permitting side, that's where um, the early site permit would, would really jump in there. Um, the Breakthrough Institute is about to um, publish a report in a few weeks that basically proposes um, a way to streamline um, acquisition of early site permits for um, um, coal plants that are eligible for the coal to nuclear transition. And that is that if the DOE, if we have a DOE led program that uh, would have you know, teams dispersed all across the country, um, whether they do it through an, uh, an entity or a subcontractor, they'll go site to site to perform the site, to perform the, the environmental characterization for the ESPs interface directly with the NRC to obtain those permits. And then once those permits are obtained um, and are owned by the DOE, then they could potentially be transferred to an interested um, developer who wants to transition their design to that particular site. Um, but but for the sake of trying to streamline or try to trying to enable rapid decarbonization, that's a potential proposal to you know speed up the regulatory process, even if it's just a small part of it. Now, I hate to jump in here because this has been such a nominally insightful and stimulating conversation and so educational for everyone. Um, and Gail, I thought you made a great point that we could talk about permitting for another couple of hours alone if we really had the time. Sally, we don't, um, but I do wanna thank everyone for spending time with us. And if you have colleagues who wanna take advantage of this um, really informational and outstanding discussion, we will be posting the um, recording on the OEP website. I mean, I'll remind everyone at the Our Energy Library, there are numerous materials on this topic if you want to dig deeper. Um, so, you know, great thanks to Christy, to Charlene, to Gail, to Brendan for joining us today, taking the time for a fascinating conversation, to Congressman Donalds for kicking things off. Um, to our partners for their support, and of course, mostly to all of you for taking the time to join us today. So thank you again um, for taking the time, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And to all of our panelists and moderator, uh, thank you again for um, this really uh, stimulating conversation. Have a great day and rest of the week.